Your installation here is responding to key figures in cultural history of Venice, I believe. Carlo Scarpa, Franco Albini and Franca Helg. An Engle Trincanato, this other female architect that uh, graduated in Venice. She was the first uh, woman to graduate in Venice in the architectural school. And she was a contemporary of Scarpa. And uh, she's actually a very interesting figure. I've discovered her work recently, I mean, last year. And uh, she, um, but because as a woman uh, working in such a male dominated uh, circuit and you know, in the 50s and the 60s, as we all know, she has, her work hasn't been so, and she, you know, she didn't really correspond to the, the idea of the communization of, uh, and so she's uh, not been really well studied, but she also did many other things. She was director of the Palazzo Ducale and also the Quirini Stampalia. She was a photographer. She wrote books on the Venice, uh, the, the popular architecture of the city. And, uh, and she really studied the city. She, was, she knew it really in its depth. And uh, so I went to the archive, which is now at the Architecture University, and looked at all many drawings and visited a building that she made in Venice with her partner and uh, and decided to incorporate some elements of her work in the exhibition. Which are the elements that refer to? So it starts downstairs at the this passage called Androne because Portugal also rents that space. I've never thought of using it before but since uh, some rooms in this uh, first floor I was not so keen to use them because uh, I couldn't really touch, you know, the space as I, ideally I would like. So I decided to close one room and use it for the press and then open that Androne, this passage that leads to the water and use it for like the first case. And uh, also thinking of the concerts that we are doing dur during the show and the first concert we're doing today, but also the other three concerts with Ali and Radik's music and thinking that musicians could also play there and this could also be a room for, for music and also for the people who use you know, the foundation and visit. There's also an hotel in the courtyard so people also, it's not necessarily the art public which kind of use that space. It's a proper thoroughfare. Yeah. There are screens and some bronze. Uh, yeah, there's a floor, a floor piece made yeah. with the uh, cork and brass and then there's this wood screens which I would always imagine in the period of aqua alt and the water coming through the you know the pores of the wood and the and then there are two lamps and that's uh, lamps which were designed by this architect Egle Trincanato which I borrowed from the building that she made in Venice called Inail and for me it was not really important how these lamps were how they look like the shape and the light it gives I just wanted to have this kind of, uh, use it as a kind of ready-made, but with this signature of this great lady that has uh, lived here. And there's a label where people can, you know, see that the lamp is designed by her, not by me. And how have you infused the elements that you've been researching and thinking about into these extraordinary kind of architectural, sculptural moments in these rooms? Well, I use... As my process, as a you know, my working process is really related with uh, measuring the idea of measuring elements that I visit and places that I'm interested in. I use a lot of measuring because I think I'm interested in the relationship of my body, you know, in terms of scale, with the space that surrounds me. So I use this as a kind of a fresh. I don't know if you use this term in English. Uh, in French, you would say affression. It's a way to understand what I'm looking at in terms of its phys physicality, but also its proximity, its scale, its, you know. At, and uh, so I use a lot of these things that I've measured the, from, you know, houses I visited of Carlos Carpa, and also the buildings of Egre Trincanato. And uh, so I've kind of incorporated this idea of the measuring into my sculptures. And, uh, and here we see a lot of, it's not so much, I don't think it's important, it's important for me how to, you know, conceive 
sculpture throughout the idea of measuring and you know the volume in terms of how can I relate scale into another room? How can I define, you know, if a lamp has certain size of sculpture has a certain size or scale or dimension? So this measure for me it's pre-given by this, you know, things that I've uh, measured before in those spaces. But there's a real sense of choreography here, of yeah. being guided yeah, yeah. around these yeah, pieces, yeah. and also yeah, I yeah, love that they so draw your eye right up to these extraordinary ceilings, mm -hmm. which makes you feel very physically yeah. present in the room. Yeah, I think it engages the audience to look up, but also to navigate space differently. I don't want to, you know, be so uh, restrictive how people should walk, but I want to guide, in a way, the audience and uh, create this kind of... Yeah, it's choreographic, but it's also this... Uh, it's embedded in the way sculpture is done, the idea of, the, like, the the repetition of doing, you know, a rope, which is kind of doing always the same movement in space and how you, you know, it's done with the thread that it's crossed the studio and you have to go back and forth, back and forth many times and then starting to do this kind of rolling of the rope. And uh, so I'm interested in that. And I think it's not an interactive sculpture where people can touch the works, etc. but I think it's embedded you know, the way it's conceived, it's embedded in these kind of movements and choreograph choreographic gestures you do, you make when you're manufacturing them. And also it happens with the, the sculptures in leather, in the space, in the main space, where you have these kind of torsions of the big, kind of very long pieces of leather with where there's like a aluminium bar inside and you kind of have to, because it's, it's much longer than we are as humans, no? It's like 10 meters long and I have to find my way, how can, can I, ma I manipulate this kind of monster, you know, with distortions and densities and moving throughout these gaps which the wood sculptures have to be able to enter this uh, kind of... Uh, it's a struggling force. You've uh, also used rubber in some of the sculptures, mm -hmm. which carries its own sense of kind of mm -hmm. tension and release and hard use. Yeah, this, this rubber is actually f used for floor. It's a rub rubbing floor. Uh, and that, that those sculptures are very much related with uh, the work of Ligia Clark. <coughs> she was a Brazilian artist uh, from the conc concrete movement. And she started these sculptures called Obra Mol, or Soft Work, or The Climbers. In Portuguese, it's called uh, Trepantes. And the idea that sculpture doesn't have form by itself, but uh, it's a flat, it's a flat sculpture, and uh, which I'm very interested in the idea of the, the kind of flatness of the sculpture. And uh, that, you know, according to uh, when, it, when, when it's placed into a kind of uh, uh, a structure or, you know, a volume, it gains, it gains torsion, it creates body, it creates... Uh, so it doesn't exist per se, but it has to exist in something. And this is also what is very interesting for me, also thinking in terms of context, you know, like thinking of the pavilion in Venice, Venice being as the city of, you know, craftsmanship and this... And trade. And trade, exactly. Craftsmanship is really important in your practice, but I believe for this show you worked with local artisans. Mm -hmm. I've worked with the glass blowing factory, which I've used, I've worked in the past. It's also a way for me to, thinking about this idea of decadence of the craftsmanship, but also in, towards the, you know, in this specific context of the city and trying to make this craftsmanship still alive and, uh, and working with this really old, you know, forms of knowledge and specific forms of uh, sources of knowledge. I really wanted the glass to be uh, thick, but also very... I wanted to, as, as it happens also in the other sculptures, I wanted the glass to reveal how it's done, how it has been blown, and you, you could see, like, uh, because blowing is such a invisible thing, you know, it's so abstract, and so you don't see you know, the blowing, you don't see it physically. And uh, I think glass, you know, I really wanted to reveal this kind of, uh, this, the movement of the breath and the spread of the breath into the, 
texture of the glass. So we we made molds in metal, like the negative shapes for these lamps, and then we put the glass really, really cold. So when they blow the glass, which is in a very hot temperature, it kind of collides with this difference of the temperatures and creates these movements of the breath inside of this metal container, like the negative space. We were talking earlier about how you hadn't encountered this space before you were invited to mm -hmm. um, <coughs> create this proposal for Venice. So what were your first reactions to how you could use it, how you could respond? It was difficult because I've never dealt with this period of history, you know, like the 15th century and because the building was done in the, in the 15th century, but then it has been renovated later in the 17th. But uh, I've never dealt with this period of history before. And uh, it, it has, it's so charged, you know, with the, because when I visited, it had these curtains and it's quite baroque, like uh, chandeliers and paintings and You've had to turn the paintings so, to the wall. Yeah, I, re I, yeah I, I really didn't want to deal with this other artist in the space. It didn't really matter which, you know, could also be amazing paintings, but it was not th something I have thought, you know, of having this presence of this artist in the space. So it's like a lot of negotiation with superintendents uh, to manage to take the paintings out and face them against the wall. I think this is already in itself such a strong gesture and try to make it nice, you know, trying to protect them nicely and present them nicely. I think the back of the painting is fantastic and <laughs> now it works and it kind of matches the, the fabric that exists on the, on the wall. And, uh, but it's a negotiation. I think, yeah, this is the term I think it describes better, best is the negotiation between me and the space. Always it's daily, you know, like trying to imagine how can I insert another layer in the room, like putting these uh, white poles in the space. So like inserting a new skin to this room, giving another frame time to the space, which is more modern, modern in the sense of uh, modernism and but creating a dialogue so it's not hiding anything but it's creates movement in space and it creates another yeah another time so I can feel more comfortable inside this room. <laughs> you said you like to your works to provoke curiosity and recognition a sense of yeah. recognition which this kind of layering does rather beautifully. Are you recognition happy? to just in terms of craftsmanship, uh, yeah, yeah. periods of design and architecture, there's mm -hmm. a really nice kind of frisson, mm -hmm. to use that wonderful word, mm -hmm. between the modernity and this mm -hmm. ancient kind of mm -hmm. skin.